In this video, we're going to look at the seedless vascular plants, or the spore-bearing vasculars. The example of plant that we use to represent this group are the ferns. We're going to see some places where ferns are more advanced than the mosses that we saw in our previous video, but we're also going to see some ways in which the ferns still lack some of the adaptations we'd like to see in a terrestrial plant. So how did we get here? If we have an organism that is a plant, we created this classification tree to help us answer, ask and answer some questions to determine what type of plant we have. And the first question we'd ask in evaluating a plant was, or is, uh, do we have vasco tissue? And if the answer is no, then we had a group of plants that we called the bryophytes, an example which was mosses, the topic of our last video. If the answer is yes, then we have what we call the vascular plants. Well, a lot of plants are vascular, so we have to ask another question. Does this plant release seeds or spores? And the answer is seeds, they're seed plants, and we continue on. But if the answer is spores, then we have our spore-bearing vasculars. For example, our ferns. And that's where we are today, talking about the seedless vascular plants. Now, when we look at the structure of a fern, we see a, a, usually a horizontal root uh, or stem called a rhizome that goes across the ground and coming off of it are individual fronds. And if you look at the undersides of the fronds, you'll see all these little dots. Let me see if I can point them out here. Just on the undersides of these leaves. And I'd ask you what you think these dots are. And many people will respond that they're spores because these are spore-bearing vasculars. But if we zoom in closer, we'll find that these aren't spores, but in fact spore cases that we call Sorus. Sorus is singular. Sori is plural. We can see a closer view here, all these little brown or black dots. Those are spore cases, not individual spores. Uh, there'd be many spores released from those sori. Now, if we look at the difference between the mosses, the bryophytes, and where we are here, over here, uh, with the ferns, and the main difference is we have vascular tissue now. So we need to remind ourselves what vascular tissue is. Vascular tissue namely xylem and phloem, is an internal system of piping or plumbing that allows plants to move materials great distances through their body in an efficient manner. This vasco tissue, this system of conduction, not only provides conduction allowing the plant to move materials, but also is a system of structural support. So these ferns, these vascular plants, have vasco tissue providing this internal system of conduction which allows an efficient movement of materials across distance also provides an internal structural support. The two types of vascular tissue are xylem and phloem. Xylem for the conduction of water and dissolved minerals, and phloem for the conduction of sugars. Now let's look at the life cycle of a fern so we can compare it to the moss that we saw earlier. Now forgive my artistic deficiencies, but here's my fern. It's beautiful. And when we look at a fern, unlike when we look at a moss, we are seeing the sporophyte generation. and we know that sporophytes make spores. So in those spore cases, those sori on the undersides of the fronds, we have spores produced. So let's release a spore. And we know that spores grow into gametophytes. Now, the gametophyte generation of a fern is probably not a structure you've seen. They're very small, maybe a centimeter across, and only a few cell layers thick. But it's a heart-shaped structure and it has a name, it's called a prothallium. This is, this prothallium is the gametophyte. So it's going to make gametes. But to see the gametes, we need to zoom in. So we can zoom in to an area right there and maybe right there. So we'll zoom in. And in this area, we might see a structure that looks kind of familiar if you've watched the moss video. It's an archegonium. And inside the archegonium, we're going to make an egg. So let me pause and write that in there. Then if we look down in this area, we might see a structure that also may fe seem familiar. And it's the antheridium. And it's going to make sperm. Now this should make sense because gametophytes make gametes and the sperm and the egg are the gametes. The structures that make them being the archegonium and the antheridium. Now, what's the next event? 
Well, by now we should know that the next event is fertilization. So I'm going to uh, just move over here and, uh, well, bring the sperm and egg together. I should bring the whole archegonium. Okay, so I rearranged that a little bit, and so the next event is fertilization. Which results in a zygote. And the zygote grows up to be a new fern or a sporophyte. Now we know whenever we draw these cycles, we need to go in and put the ploidy, haploid, or diploid of each of these, and we can start anywhere. I usually start with the spore, because I know the spore is always haploid. And uh, gametophytes are also haploid. So to get from here, from spore to gametophyte, we must have had mitosis and cell division. And the gametophytes haploid, as are the gametes are haploid, so the gametes are made by mitosis also. And fertilization results in a diploid zygote, and the diploid zygote grows by mitosis and cell division into a diploid sporophyte. Diploid sporophytes make haploid spores through meiosis. Now, we have a dominant sporophyte, meaning when we look at a fern, when we see this, we're seeing the diploid generation, the sporophyte generation. And the, oops, wrong one. There's my nice one. The gametophyte generation, or the prothallium, is much smaller. It doesn't last as long. It's small, but it is independent. It lives separate from the sporophyte. But we have one major issue left to talk about, and that is, how does the sperm get to the egg? How does the sperm get from here to here? Well, the answer should be familiar by now. It has to swim. The ferns, or the spore-bearing vasculars, or the seedless vasculars, rely on water for reproduction. Now, it's not having to swim a great distance. This whole structure may be a centimeter across, and it doesn't require a lot of water. The morning dew, a uh, mist, a uh, splash of water, a drop of water could be enough. But this does limit uh, these ferns in terms of the habitat that they can live in. They can't live in super dry areas. They have to live in moist, human habitats. So let's think about what we've, where we've come to, what we've gained, and what we've yet to do. The seedless vasculars, the lycophytes, horsetails, ferns, and club mosses, have underground stems that run along uh, laterally, uh, horizontally, uh, fronds, and we talked about the spore cases, root light structures called rhizoids for absorption. These are just general characteristics. They have vascular tissue. That's kind of the, the big new thing we have as we move from mosses to ferns. If you recall, that's kind of the basis of this division. We have vascular tissue now which means, uh, hold on, they can grow bigger because that vascular tissue allows them to move materials efficiently throughout a larger body. They can grow upwards because we have structural support. And we know that we have a new uh, change in a dominant sporophyte versus uh, a dominant gametophyte. We do have an independent gametophyte, small prothallium, but it's um, smaller in size. But we do have this one limitation where we still rely on water for reproduction. So in that way, ferns are not advanced.